Our next question is, how do these droplets move around in the indoor environment? One way that they're removed is through settling to the, to the floor or to tabletops or other surfaces. And the settling velocity of a particle, we assume a droplet, we assume it's a sphere, is determined by Stokes' law. Um, and the equation is shown here, the settling velocity v is equal to the gravitational acceleration g times the particle diameter squared times the particle density, which we can assume is somewhere around <clears throat> that of water, one gram per cubic meter, divided by 18 times the dynamic viscosity of air. And what I've plotted here is the time for a droplet to settle from a height of 1.5 meters, uh, about five feet, I think, as a function of the diameter of that droplet. And you can see that this, this curve falls off rapidly. So if we look at a 20 micron droplet, it's gonna settle within maybe um, in probably about a minute or so. If we look at a 10 micrometer droplet, then that's gonna be maybe around eight minutes or so. But then if we go to five microns, and again, this is where that cutoff is, the, the kind of defined cutoff between what they call aerosol and droplet transmission, but even a five micron particle can hang around in the air for about 30 minutes, um, where, during which it has a chance to be inhaled, of course. Um, and then of course, if we go to smaller, even smaller particle sizes or droplet sizes, those, those, those lifetimes in the, in the air are going up sky high and you know, things can last for hours. Um, this is calculated for still or quiescent air, of course. These times could be larger or smaller, depending on the actual airflow patterns in a room. The other thing that we need to think about is that these droplets are, are wet. So imagine you, you spill some water, uh, some droplets of water on a, on a countertop, and you, you can see them initially, but if you come back an hour later, they're, they're gone, they've evaporated. So the respiratory droplets that we release into air are very wet. They've come out of an environment, the respiratory tract, which is very humid, probably saturated, and then they're released into the ambient air. So in winter time around here, the uh, relative humidity is often around 20 to 30 percent if you've got heating. Um, in the summertime, it can be maybe be 50 to 60 percent or so. Um, or depending on where you live, it could be even higher. And so these droplets pretty rapidly, especially the smaller ones below, let's say 20, 10 to 20 microns, uh, shrink within seconds to reach their new equilibrium diameter. And the way we determine that is through the, the Kohler equation, um, which tells us about the vapor pressure above a curved surface of some, some liquid solution that's not just pure water. Of course, if it were pure water, it would evaporate fully eventually, but these respiratory fluid droplets contain lots of sodium, lots of salts, including sodium chloride, um, proteins, surfactants, and other things. And so that affects the vapor pressure um, which we can calculate as shown by this equation. I won't go into the details here of that. But what this allows us to do is to predict at any given relative humidity, what is the ratio of the final droplet diameter to the initial droplet diameter. So of course at 100% relative humidity, um, that ratio is one because the droplet comes out, it's totally humid, it doesn't shrink at all. But as if it comes out into a drier environment, let's say, we start with a 10 micron droplet and it comes out into an environment with 20% relative humidity, it's going to shrink down to about four microns. And this is for a droplet containing uh, physiological levels of sodium chloride and protein, which are nine grams per liter and then 76, I think, grams per liter. Um, another thing to notice is that most of that evaporation, that shrinkage happens um, within the kind of the at very high or even I guess I should say the equilibrium size drops off pretty quickly even at high humidities. So even at by the time you're down to 9, 80 or 90 percent humidity your droplets already half of its initial size as you can see by that red dot. So we needed to understand size in order to figure out how these what happens to the droplets when they're in indoor air. So if we think about uh, someone, let's say coughs or breathes or talks, and they, they release lots of droplets, emit lots of droplets into the indoor air, there's um, three different ways that the virus in those droplets can be removed. So there's ventilation, which is physical removal of the droplets 
just by blowing, you know, the air in the room blows to outside and is replaced by presumably clean air coming from somewhere else outside. Um, they can be removed by settling, as we discussed, especially for the larger ones. And then we can have, even if the viruses are physically still present, they can be inactivated. So kind of they, they de decay and they lose their ability to infect. So what we can do is through a, a, balance, a mass balance, actually a number balance um, equation, where we're looking at the number of infectious viruses um, per cubic meter of air. So our C sub D in this equation is the concentration of infectious virus in aerosols of a certain diameter. And we can see how that changes in time. And it is, we have loss. There's no other sources. In this case, we're going to assume that the person coughs once and then there's no more virus that's maybe they leave the room and there's no more virus released. So the processes that affect the virus that's still there include gravitational settling. And the term for that is the, the settling velocity that we saw earlier divided by the height of the room. Um, and then we also have removal by ventilation. So this lambda is the air exchange rate, which represents um, how many air changes per hour, let's say, happen. So a typical residential air exchange rate is 0.5 to 1 air change per hour, meaning that half to one volume of the, of the room in your air is going to kind of change out per hour. And then we have K to represent the inactivation rate of those viruses. They, they slowly decay over time at a certain rate. Some go faster than others. So C sub D here, we're doing this as a function of the aerosol or droplet diameter. The settling velocity depends on the diameter. The diameter depends on relative humidity. And it turns out that the inactivation rate K also depends on relative humidity. We'll look at that relationship here, virus viability versus relative humidity. And I should warn you that this is a relationship just for one set of experiments um, with a certain type of the virus in a certain type of liquid. And that can, the results, and this is flu virus, a certain strain of flu virus, those results, this relationship can vary depending on the exact virus and the type of liquid that it's in. This figure shows the decay rate of the virus as a function of relative humidity. The y-axis is actually upside down, so I'm showing better survival at the top. So on the upper left corner, we see that at low relative humidity, around 20%, the virus decays less. That decay rate is closer to zero. And then as we head over to the right-hand side, you can see at 80% relative humidity, the decay rate is maybe around 0 0.028 or so per minute. Um, so it's a, the virus decays more at higher relative humidity. And, and the, this curve also shows kind of a linear relationship with relative humidity. But as we'll discuss later, um, in reality, there may be more of a U-shaped relationship. So we can put that information into our equation for K, and then we can solve that differential equation um, at each diameter um, and at a specific, at a certain relative humidity. And so this, these results show you um, the assumptions that we made here were that the air exchange rate is one air change per hour, and we're at a relative humidity of 50%. So I'm showing you the size distribution of the viruses in the, in the droplets and aerosols, um, and then each color that I'll show you corresponds to a different time. So the person coughs, and at time zero, here's where the viruses are. We saw that when the person coughs, that really there's a peak around one micron in terms of number of droplets, but because those larger droplets can potentially contain so much more virus and the volume goes with diameter cubed, um, we see more of the virus in those larger droplets, the kind of 40 to 50 micron ones. Um, and this actually does not incorporate some of the results that I discussed where the majority of virus is found in the fine aerosols. Although we'll see that shift happening here. So after one minute, those, all, the, all the droplets shrink right down to about 40% of their original size. And then we lose the larger ones due to gravitational settling. And then after five minutes, that curve shifts further to the left as we continue losing the larger droplets due to gravitational settling. And then the whole curve shifts downward because the area under the curve shift is getting smaller and the total number of viruses is smaller because we are removing them by gravity, by ventilation, and then they're also inactivating. 
And then you can see at 10 minutes, the curve looks like that, and it continues to shift down into the left. And now we have more of our virus in those finer uh, droplets. The previous figure showed you one relative humidity at 50%. So now we can look at instead, now we'll vary the, uh, and that was over time, different times, now we'll vary the relative humidity. Because as I mentioned, the relative humidity affects the droplet, kind of equilibrium droplet size. Although once you get below 80, 90%, there's not much sensitivity to that. And then also it affects, has a big effect on the inactivation rate. And so under very dry conditions at 10% relative humidity, you can see that you know, after a certain amount of time, there's still a lot of infectious virus around, particularly with a peak around 10 microns. Um, and so again, this was at a certain time in the model. And then at 30% relative humidity, the amount drops. And as we go to higher humidities, the amount that's, that's still airborne drops further. And so the concentrations are higher at lower relative humidities, maybe mainly because the inactivation rate, which I want to caveat, was determined in the laboratory is lower. So if we look at the removal efficiency of each of these different mechanisms um, under different conditions and kind of how they vary with humidity, we can see, for example, that an air, at an air exchange rate of one per hour, um, settling removes is very efficient at removing our droplets. And there's a slight humidity dependence. So you can see going from the red to the purple. Um, and that's because, again, we have at higher humidity, let's say the 90%, the droplets are a little bit bigger, and so they'll settle out faster. Um, ventilation doesn't discriminate based on humidity, and at this low air exchange rate, the removal efficiency of ventilation is less than 20%. Inactivation removes a little bit, and then you can see the, the total is shown on the right-hand set of bars where there's a slight uh, dependence on humidity. But now if we increase the air exchange rate to 10 per hour, um, you can see that the, main, the thing that changes is the ventilation. And so now ventilation is like 80% efficient at removing things, and our total removal efficiency is much closer to 100%, especially between settling and, and ventilation. We have seen that viruses can be removed from indoor air by settling, ventilation, and inactivation, and some of these processes depend on humidity. 